Well, thank you. And sharks, I know what everyone is thinking, but I challenge you to look at these beautiful pictures around you and these majestic creatures. I feel so fortunate that I get to work with these charismatic animals and just really incredible species that are such great ambassadors for the ocean. But they have sort of an image problem. And I think most of us would agree when we think of sharks, uh, it's really something uh, more like this. So even a couple hundred years ago in early America, Copley had it right that you know these mythological creatures that we have in our minds that we should fear and man-eaters, it's really much more than that, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. I uh, am in the water all the time, up close and personal with these animals, and uh, when you begin talking about fear, I can tell you standing right here on this red dot is way, way scarier than in the water with them. And so despite this image, you know, that was perpetuated, and uh, even relatively recently, of course, an iconic show, um, you know, Benchley and Spielberg did a great job of convincing us to fear sharks and even developed major campaigns of fisheries to remove these animals from the water. And as that myth was perpetuated, uh, other things began to happen. And so to give you some facts, today, 250,000 sharks will be removed from the water. 250,000, hundreds of millions of sharks a year, 2,000 more by the time I finish this uh, presentation today. And this is what it's about. This is really reality. The reality is the shark should be fearing us, not the other way around. So if you squint real hard and look at each one of these, that's individual shark fins. This is one tiny portion of a rooftop of hundreds in downtown Hong Kong. And these fins are being provided to the shark fin trade, both legal and a heavy black market trade in these fins. To put it in perspective, one fin of a desirable species like a whale shark can sell for $20,000 for one single pectoral fin. These types of fins here routinely sell for $300 to $500 a pound. So you can imagine what demand is on the ocean to provide these. And so um, I'm going to show you a video here in just a second. And uh, I thought long and hard, should I show this video, should I not? But I thought you probably should see it. In fact, I've edited out some of the, the uh, uh, little more brutal parts. But this is really what happens. Um, it's happening in typically underdeveloped countries. And you can't blame the folks for putting food on the table. So these animals are extracted from the ocean, obviously alive. Their meat is of very little value. And it's the fins they're after. So uh, they're quickly thrown back into the ocean alive. Not for long, of course, they'll drown pretty rapidly. But it's the fins that they're after. And the fins, it's really about this. And what we call this is extinction for a $100 bowl of soup. And that's it, shark fin soup. It's a very prestigious dish to serve at special events. It conveys a level of prestige and, and that power and that sort of thing. And that drives this illegal shark finning trade, both legal and, and legal, I might add. So if you think about that for a second, I want everyone to sit here, and, and I know we're all thinking, you know, spring break's coming up, you know, sharks eat us and all that kind of stuff. And is it no sharks, you know, kind of like rattlesnakes? That's a good thing, right? But I want you to look at this planet for a minute and really look. Of course, the first thing you notice, it's blue. Despite being land mammals, we live on a blue planet that's covered by oceans, about 70%. And I want everyone to sit here for a minute and take a deep breath. You got to you feel the air and oxygen coming in? Take one more breath. Well, that second breath and a half, you can thank Mother Ocean for that because it's the oceans that are providing the oxygen that we breathe. And it occurs through a very complex set of interactions. Yes, plants and the rainforest produce oxygen, but it's really microscopic plants in the ocean at the very bottom of the food chain that are producing that oxygen. And it occurs through a complex web of interactions. And what's interesting as scientists that we've discovered is you can't pick out one of those interactions and not expect the whole deck of cards to begin crumbling. But what I want to bring your attention to is what's sitting right there at the top, and that is our apex predators of the sharks, what we call the great balance keepers of the ocean. And they keep everything below them in check. So as scientists, we got very concerned about what happens when we pull those balance keepers out, and are we going to get the system out of 
of, of whack. And so we began wondering, well, what about sharks in the Gulf of Mexico? What do we know right here in our own backyard? And so we discovered quickly, well, we don't know much at all. Um, we couldn't figure out even, we didn't know what species even occurred here, when they occurred, and some of the much more important parameters, such as migration and where they go to pup or have their young, where do they go to breed. So we first dug through a series of archives to try to document, we had no baseline of what sharks looked like in the past. And we discovered that sharks today look very much different uh, than, they, than they had in the past. We've lost some of our great sharks, our big hammerheads, our big tiger sharks, and species such as this. But the good news is today as scientists, we are armed with all types of technology. It's just quite incredible. We can turn these animals that you see here in this slide into scientific data collection machines. And so uh, this is a mako shark, one of the fastest fish on the planet. We've got GoPro cameras mounted to it to observe all types of behavioral interactions. We've got satellite tags just like this one attached to its fin. And it's quite amazing that I could take out my cell phone right now and tell you anywhere in the whole planet where these sharks are at this very moment. So very powerful scientific information that allow us to make all sorts of discoveries. And so how we go about that and collecting these fish is we've got to catch them, of course, and maybe some of you guys are fishermen here, and we collect them by hook and line, by hand line. This was a nine-foot shark. You'll see a video here in just a few minutes of Madeline, and this bigger tiger shark came in to inspect it, and we captured both of them and tagged them just like the fin that you see here, and they're swimming and reporting back almost on a daily basis. And the sharks handle this process very well. Once they're upside the boat, we have a tail wrap, a, tail, a rope on their tail, and they're still secured by the hook. If you're a fisherman, we don't use 20-pound test line. We use 2,220-pound test. And we manually pull these in very quickly because the last thing we want to do is hurt these animals. And once they come alongside the boat, they're very, very docile. Um, we attach the fin, the, the uh, tag to their fin. We actually, you'll see in a second, drill through their fins, but it's pretty much like our fingernails. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt them at all. So if you watch this video of Madeline coming up, we're pulling the shark in after about 10 minutes. It doesn't take long. And yes, my wife is happy to know we do carry very good insurance. <laughs> and uh, we've just attached the shark. We're just putting, bolting it on at the last minute. Okay, Judd, could you hand me the second nuts, please? And the hook's in the corner of the mouth. We just picked it out with bolt cutters, and they handle this process very well. Madeline reports back nearly every day. Every time her dorsal fin clears the surface, like on this tag, it sends us a high-speed relayed message to our smartphones of exactly where they are. We load it up on our web page and serve it back out to the public. And man, has this been popular, from aquariums to schools to all sorts of things. It gets the public engaged about the awareness and why we should care about sharks. But also, back to the plight of sharks in the Gulf, this is Sam Houston's track. It was a track we, a, a shark we tagged for the Houston Museum. That's where Sam Houston came from, traveled nearly 4,000 miles all around the Gulf, and I would draw your attention, is that it begins to go south. And while we are concerned about south in the Gulf of Mexico, it's the heart of the longline fleet. This was illegal activity actually in the United States. A three-mile-long gillnet was captured by Coast Guard and the, federal, the state game wardens. 3,000 sharks in that particular net. Most of them would have been destined for the shark fin trade. Of course, they're fins. So anyway, but it's not all doom and gloom, and I don't want to leave you there. Things are changing. Talks like this, even in Asia, people are beginning to realize that maybe we shouldn't be doing this and become much more aware of our oceans. But there's a lot more to do. And it hinges mainly on changing the perception of sharks. So I want to end with you just a little bit today because I know on the back of everyone's mind is, yeah, I believe the guy's what he's saying. You know, we don't want to be finning and all that, but you know, I still go in the ocean, and, and, and what's going to happen um, when I come face to face with one of these guys? And so I want to, you know, calm your fears today, and that is when you look at what's your chance of getting bit by a shark, well, very low. These are the shark bites in Texas, of course, on popular beaches, but in the last 100 years, only 37 shark bites. Notice I said bites, and two fatalities way before modern, modern times. 
And so if you wanted to put that in bigger perspective, uh, last year, 30 people killed by ants, 2,900 by hippopotamuses, so keep that in mind. And driving up yesterday from Port Aransas, 240 just this year alone um, by um, Texas highways. And guess what, but only five by sharks. So I think I'll leave you here in a second, in another video, but I wanna tell you my favorite statistic. You're much more likely to be bitten by a crazy person that thinks they're a shark than actually being bit by a shark. So we need to rethink the shark and Leslie Rose Shad is a great director and she came up with a short video that I think captures everything in, the, in, in this and I wanna leave it with you today and I want you to think about this tomorrow um, when you're having your morning, morning coffee. So remember, rethink the shark and of course you'll recognize this spoof on uh, the famous Jaws scene. Yes. Last year, 791 people from defective toasters, but only four from sharks. So rethink the sharks, because a world without sharks is a much scarier place. Thank you.